In the previous lecture, we looked at an extension that brought the solo model more in line with what we observe in reality regarding growth experiences of some countries. The empirics do show that developed countries have been growing at about two percentage points per year over more than a century, while Africa as a whole only grew at about 0.8% in the same period. However, this extension did not provide any explanation as to why those economies grow in the long run. It postulated that technology grows at some constant rate, but provided no explanation as to why. As such, the solar model is not a model that endogenously explains growth at the steady state, even if augmented with constant technology growth. There are such models, however, theories that provide rationales for why economies can experience sustained growth in per capita variables in the long run. And these are precisely our focus for this lecture. We will focus on three ideas. The first one will argue for a broader definition of capital, which imply constant as opposed to decreasing returns to scale in terms of capital per capita. The second will focus on technology in a deeper way, looking at the mechanism through which innovations take place. And the third will look into trade, economic integration, and technological diffusion. Let's start with the first. The idea that capital can exhibit constant returns to scale, or in other words, that the average product of capital is constant. The idea is to think of capital more broadly, as to include human capital, which essentially consists of knowledge that enhances production processes. Human capital has similar features to productive capital, in the sense that it is productive, depreciates over time, and can be increased by investment. But it's much more reasonable to assume that if we double not only machines and buildings, but also human capital while keeping raw labor fixed, that GDP may also double. So, if we take our production function and assume it to have constant returns to scale in per capita terms, we end up with the expression that income per capita equals technology times capital per capita, which dubs this the AK model. This model exhibits a constant average product that is equal to the level of technology. If we substitute this into the solo model equation, we get that the growth rate of capital per capita is now given by the difference between the product of the savings rate with the technology level and the savings rate times depreciation plus population growth rate term. As we can see in the figure, this leads economies to grow at the constant growth rates in the steady state that will differ in terms of savings, depreciation, and population growth rates. However, this framework has two flaws. First, it cannot explain the convergent path that we witnessed with respect to some countries' experiences we observed before. Second, ultimately, it cannot explain either the process through which human capital is formed it merely postulates that economies grow because they produce more than they consume and that the difference keeps accumulating in a way that can increase everyone's living standards indefinitely. We will now focus on the idea that technology growth is not exogenous and that research and development activities do respond to incentives. Note that countries do spend significant shares of GDP on R&D. This contributes to new products, better products, or superior methods of production. Therefore, the growth rate of technology depends on resources allocated to research and development, and ultimately, so will the growth rate of the economy. A key point of this framework, though, is that the benefits of ideas and new technologies are not entirely appropriated by their respective inventors, in the sense that when the Wright brothers went out to invent the airplane, they didn't have to start from scratch, from the wheel to the combustion en engine. There are positive externalities to these activities. As such, in equilibrium, there will be a suboptimal investment in research and development, 
and there is, as such, a logic for public subsidization of R&D activities. These ideas were formalized by David Romer in the early 1980s, in his PhD dissertation. Later on, in 2018, Paul Romer would become a Nobel laureate for incorporating the ideas of technological advances in macroeconomic analysis. We will now provide a brief overview of the building blocks of the first version of what became known as the Romer model for endogenous growth. Total labor force is divided into workers producing final output, LY, and workers devoted to the production of scientific knowledge, LA, such that total labor used equates the sum of the two. The labor force is assumed to grow at a constant and exogenous rate, N. It is also assumed that the share of workers in each sector is constant over time and exogenously determined. Finally, the research sector has monopoly power over its inventions. Patents and wages equate across sectors. Total factor productivity evolves as new inputs are invented, where x1 raised to alpha plus x2 raised to alpha and so forth are a different types of capital goods, individually subject to diminishing returns. In this framework, A, the number of different capital goods, is not fixed over time. In fact, its change equates gamma times the share of workers in the R&D sector raised to lambda times the level of A raised to phi. Lambda captures the degree of decreasing returns to scale in terms of the number of researchers. A captures the existing scientific knowledge, the externality aspect of ideas. And phi captures the marginal return of increasing the stock of existing scientific knowledge. To motivate this, it makes sense that new ideas would accumulate faster if more people work in R&D activities and if these are being created in a context of higher knowledge. It is good to remember words popularized by Isaac Newton, who said that, if I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. To make the aggregate production function more simple, let's express aggregate capital as the sum of the individual capital goods. The law of motion for capital is similar as before. Capital increases by net investment. Since all capital goods play an identical role in the production process, one can assume each of them faces similar demand and have an equal weight in production. Together, these assumptions mean that we can rewrite the production function in the following way, where output is a function of the share of population allocated to the final good production sector, and capital is just A times the quantity demanded of each capital good X bar, with both factors aggregated in the standard Cobb-Douglas form. Remember from before that aggregate capital is just the sum of the A individual capital goods, which equate to A times X bar. This means that X bar is equal to K over A. Substitute this in the production function, along with the fact that the number of people working in the final goods sector is equal to its share in the total population, we get the following production function. In Moodle, you can find a document that solves the model in detail and derives all the expressions I will show you next. For brevity, I'm only going to comment on the results, intuition, and what is what we learn with the Romer model. The growth rate of technology is equal to the growth rate of output in the steady state and is now solved within the model and given by the following expression. This shows that the long-run growth rate of output per worker depends positively on three factors. First, the parameter lambda. The higher it is, the less diminishing returns impact the addition of an extra researcher and the faster the economy grows along the steady state path. Second, the strength of the standing on the shoulder of giants effect, phi. The larger it is, the stronger is the effect of existing inventions into helping in the discovery of new inventions and consequently, the faster the economy will grow. 
Third, the growth of the number of workers n. The higher it is, the faster the economy adds researchers. It may sound counterintuitive at first that higher population growth would lead to faster per capita income growth, but if we focus on the very long run, say 200 years back, we did see both a dramatic acceleration both in population levels and GDP per capita. However, this is heavily contentious fit feature. In later work that was built on top of this typically eliminated this feature. Let's now look at convergence dynamics to see if the model is stable, in the sense that it has a steady state growth path in the long run. The growth rate of technology in the model is given by this expression. If we proceed as before by taking the first difference of the natural logarithm of both sides of this, we get that the growth rate of the growth rate is given by this expression. We can then show that the growth rate of technology is decreasing when above its steady state level and increasing when below. Next, we move to the question of what would be optimal in terms of research and development. We can solve for the steady state value of output per worker to get the following expression. It seems awfully complicated, but let's set z to be equal to lambda over 1 minus phi, and we'll aggregate the remaining terms, all of them taken as exogenous in the variable x. Then we have simply the following expression. To find the optimal share of workers in the R&D sector in the steady state, we just take the derivative of output per worker with respect to SA, equate it to zero, and solve for it. We then get that it is equal to lambda divided by one minus phi plus lambda. Should we expect the economy by itself to reach an equilibrium where the share of workers in the research sector is optimal? The answer is no. The reason why relates to the fact that there are externalities in the R&D sector that are not taken into account by R&D firms when deciding the optimal amount of researchers to employ. To see this more clearly, notice that the production function we started with leads to both positive and negative externalities. On one hand, a positive externality of R&D activities due to the giant shoulders effect. Researchers do not internalize the effect that their inventions have on boosting future discoveries, and hence, the higher the fee is, the more likely that there will be few R&D being done. On the other hand, a negative externality related to diminishing marginal productivity of the number of researchers, which, ceteris paribus, will lead to too much R&D being conducted. Will it be too much or too few R&D? That depends on the relative strength of the two externalities. Jones and Williams, in 2001, claim that it is much more likely that will be too few spending on R&D. To understand their reasoning, remember that the steady state growth rate of the economy is given by lambda times n divided by 1 minus phi, and therefore lambda over 1 minus phi is the ratio of the growth rate of output per worker to the growth rate of the population. Suppose these two growth rates are the same, a reasonable ballpark assumption for developed for developed countries. This means that this ratio is one and the optimal share of researchers, which we found to be equal to lambda over one minus phi plus lambda, is equal to one half. There is no country in the world where 50% of the population works in research and development activities. Of course, we can adjust the parameters here and there, but the result that R&D activities should be a larger part of GDP won't change. And as such, this analysis suggests that there is scope for policy intervention to promote R&D activities. This is actually a prediction of the model, that it is optimal for government to subsidize R&D activities, that is observed in reality. As we can see in this figure, direct government funding and tax support for businesses R&D is a widespread feature of most economies. 
Another idea that connects technology with convergence comes from the idea that imitation and adaptation of one country's technology is a relatively common feature of world dynamics. The rate of technological diffusion to a developing country is high if the two countries trade a lot with each other, have high education levels to leverage such knowledge spillovers, and has a well-functioning legal and political system that favor entrepreneurial activity. This provides an alternative tale of convergence between poor and rich countries, as imitation and adaptation are cheaper than innovating. However, as countries catch up, opportunities like that grow scarcer, and in the limit, countries end up growing at the same rate as the technological frontier.